It has to do with particular historical and cultural circumstances. A lot of it developed in Paris. Uh, in fact, what Frequence and Cal are talking about is Paris irrationalism. And if you look at the, the history of French culture since the Second World War, it's kind of it has some strange characteristics. Uh, say, let's take the 1970s when this began to blossom. Uh, the French intellectuals were the last Stalinists, dedicated Stalinists. I mean, some of them were shaken a little by 1956, but if they weren't Stalinists, they were Maoists. I mean, I remember, I, I don't know if it's fair to mention names, but let's say uh, Christopher, I happened to meet in the mid-70s, flaming Maoist, uh, and it was pretty common all the way through. Uh, they, uh, the French intellectuals have a, there's a history in France which is, has justification that they're somehow at the peak of cultural life. So they have to be in whatever they're doing, that's what's important. In fact, France is an extremely insular uh, culture, always has been. It, uh, everything is in France, nothing is anywhere else. Anything that's anywhere else doesn't matter. Uh, so for example, it takes a, some other domain, logical positivism. And it spread over the world in the 20s, 30s. Uh, by the 1950s and 60s, it had been sort of assimilated into the current. It wasn't a passionate ideology anymore. It never even reached France. The first uh, translations into French, of course, of uh, uh, work of the, say, Vienna positivists, it was actually in the 1980s. And it was from uh, a young French... Uh, philosopher, Pierre Jacob, who, who came to Boston, learned about it, and then came back and uh, translated uh, work from the 1930s and 40s, which by then had kind of mostly been forgotten in, in the West and was just being revived in Paris. Uh, I, I mean, it's even true in fields like uh, in the sciences. I mean, they, they have a rich tradition in some areas, but say, uh, I remember about 30 years ago or so, there was an article in uh, there was an article in some science journal uh, discussing the uh, history of the acceptance of evolutionary theory, sorry, Darwinian evolutionary theory, and in, in, uh, as it spread around the world, and it, pretty much the same course. You know, some resistance uh, finally overcame it. By the time the article was written, it was the standard scientific doctrine everywhere, with one exception, France. Uh, a, a large number of the uh, professional biologists were still pre-Darwinian. This didn't seem plausible to me, so I asked a friend who's a, a Nobel laureate in biology who got his education in France, in fact. I asked him, does that make any sense? And he just laughed. He said, he said the only reason it isn't 100% true is that uh, Jacques Monod had been in the resistance and as a reward for his resistance service, he was granted a small laboratory. And out of that laboratory came all of the great French modern biology, uh, Monod, Jacob, and you know, other great biologists, but it's that little item. Well, this gets back to this, the Stalinism of, and Maoism of the 1970s. Uh, that suddenly collapsed. Uh, what uh, one of the things that caused it to collapse was uh, uh, Solzhenitsyn's uh, uh, Gulag. It was translated in France, big sensation. All of a sudden, everyone became a passionate anti-communist. And since it's Paris, they had to be the first ones who ever discovered it. So I remember going there and hearing from leading intellectuals things I knew when I was 10 years old, because you know, we were reading it then. You know? but, uh, it was all new, discovered, and they had to have something novel. Well, what do you do that's novel? Uh, I should add another feature of Paris cultural life. The French uh, intellectuals tend to be, uh, you know, vedette, and they're media stars. So their uh, French intellectuals are taken very seriously. Uh, they're on the front pages of Le Monde and so on. I, it's probably not a good thing. But it, if you want to be taken seriously, you have to have something exciting to say like a movie star, you know, or a, a, you know, a television figure. 
And it's not easy to come up with exciting new ideas. So you have to come up with crazy ideas. <laughs> and uh, th then they can make it to the front pages. Uh, so, uh, uh, and, and this is kind of what went on. Uh, well, one of the ways to have uh, exciting new ideas is to tear everything to shreds and say everything was wrong. You know, the Enlightenment was wrong. Uh, the, there's no foundationalism. They're right. There, there's no foundationalism. That was known in the 17th century. Uh, but they had to rediscover it and put it in a fancy way and so on and so forth. Well, out of this comes this uh, irrational tendency, which was very uh, welcome in many areas because it did undermine uh, dedicated activism. I, I happened to be in Paris uh, a couple of months ago, about a year ago, I guess, giving talks. And one of them was a big political talk organized by Le Monde Diplomatique. And uh, you know, good usual discussion, questions from the floor and so on. Uh, one young man uh, got up, I forget whether you were there for this. Yeah. He uh, had a ra rather plaintive question. He said, he said, Bertrand Russell tells us we should look for the truth, but the philosophers tell us there is no truth. So what should we do? Uh, <laughs> the philosophers means the fashionable people who call themselves philosophers in France. Well, you don't hear that kind of thing anywhere else in the world, except where this, this influence has spread. And it has spread to intellectual circles in much of the world. Uh, in the United States, for example, it's mostly confined to comparative literature departments. So if they talk to each other in incomprehensible uh, rhetoric, nobody cares. Uh, the place where it's been really harmful is in the third world because third world intellectuals are badly needed in the popular movements. They can make contributions. And a lot of them are just drawn away from this. Uh, anthropologists, uh, sociologists, and others, they're drawn away into these arcane, uh, in my view, mostly meaningless discourses, and are dissociated from popular struggles. And you can see the, uh, you can see the impact. I mean, I've had experiences around the third world. I kind of unfair. Maybe I won't even talk about them. But they re they really indicate uh, how the level of irrationality that grows out of this undermines uh, the opportunities for uh, doing something really significant and important. I mean, you know, rationality is uh, uh, it's a tool that you better have if you want to achieve anything. Uh, you might as well have some grasp of what the real world is like. If you give up on that, you're a, you can be an easy victim for any outside force. It is kind of like uh, consumerism. It diverts people from uh, concentrating in a serious way on doing something about their own problems, real problems.